Okay, let's turn to look at a, a, a different kinds of interviews. I've already mentioned several times this difference between the, um, the structured and the unstructured. Let me just recap that again. I think there are two major divisions in, in interview types, and I'm taking, talking here particularly about the research interview, although this does apply perhaps to other kinds of interview, but the, of the research interview. The first type is the respondent interview, where the respondent is, in, is, um, is uh, or rather, sort of where the interviewer is in charge, um, and, and you know, the interviewer um, basically is determining what gets said and what is asked and so on. And of course, the most extreme form of this is the highly structured interview, where you start with a set of questions and you ask them in that order, and then you get the answers to each one in turn. Um, a fully structured, a bit like having a questionnaire in front of you. In fact, some surveys are done this way by having a structured questionnaire, which somebody sits with you and asks uh, those questions as you go through. Um, a slightly more variable version of that is a semi structured where you have a checklist of questions you want, or topics you want to, to ask about, and, and you actually read out the questions, but you allow perhaps some variability in answers, some follow through with each one, a, a bit more questioning after each question. So you're beginning to move away from the tightly structured, I read out this question, and then you have to answer it, and that's it, and then we move on to the next one. That's the, the most structured form. Semi-structured allows you to have a bit of discussion about each of those topics, but there is still a list of topics done in that order. Um, for, for the strummy structure. Now, of course, you can see how, what I mean here about the interviewer being in charge. The interviewer determines what questions get asked and what kind of answers are acceptable in one sense, what kind of things are wanted from the respondent. The, 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 the contrast is, is the second type where the, you might say the respondent's in charge. It's the informer interviews where the person you're interviewing has much more control over what is being said and how it's being said and so on. And this is the, uh, the key aspect of, of an unstructured interview. It becomes more difficult to do because much more in interest in the, the interaction between the interviewer and the interviewee. Um, and it can be much more variable about how that goes, not even necessarily in the same order each time. Um, and um, the person is asked to answer at length and then is probed at length. In other words, you ask follow-up questions uh, on the same topic, asking them to give you more and more detail about things. In fact, very often interviewers get quite used to this and will give you the detail without being asked. So once you get going and once you've got a rapport between you and the interviewee going, um, you know, starting just a few words will start them off into a long kind of lengthy explanation about what happened to them and what they did and why they did it and so on, what they thought. So it's much more like a free conversation, much less like a standardised set of questions, and much more like a kind of interplay of ideas between uh, respondent and interviewer. Beware, though, it is not a conversation. It is not, in many respects, like a conversation. It may sound a bit like it, it may be relaxed, it may be open in that sense, a bit like a conversation with a friend, but it isn't a conversation because the interviewer is still there determining what goes on. And the interviewer also is trying very hard not to give away too much about what they think about the situation. It's, it's perhaps impossible to, give every, you know, to hide everything from the respondent, but as an interviewer, your job is there to get the respondent to say things, not to tell the respondent things about you. Um, and so in that sense, it is different from a conversation where there's always two sides to a conversation, or at least there should be a good conversation. Um, in an interview, you expect it to be one-sided. The respondent is giving everything, and you, the interviewer, is giving relatively little. Um, um, so it is different in that sense, but it feels more like a conversation. It's more balanced in that way. And it produces, this is a term from Clifford Geertz, an American anthropologist, um, his term for the kind of information you get in this way, from these kind of deep discussions and, and um, sessions with interviewees is what he called thick descriptions. Uh, and I mean, I think it's a kind of metaphor, but what it means is that we have a description of what their life is like in great detail, uh, in all kinds of dimensions being expressed about what's happening to them and how they feel about it and, and what they thought and, and what they were doing and what was done to them and so on. 
and in this kind of interview, interviewees are deliberately encouraged to produce these kinds of elaborated and detailed answers. And so you, the interviewer, will prompt them again and again with questions to say, yeah, can you tell me more about that? Can you, you know, explain that and so on? OK, so that's, that's the, the different kind of structural types of, uh, of interview um, in terms of who's in charge. And I have to say, most of the time when we talk about interviews, we're talking about the unstructured kind. We're talking about the, or the relatively unstructured, the, the kind in which the respondent is being encouraged to express themselves, to tell you how they experience the world from their perspective, using their terminology uh, and their ideas. But there's another kind of, of way of classifying interviews, and that's by the, the situation. That, uh, again, research interviews here, I mean, particularly. What kind of situation are you in? And here's, here's a list of some of them. I'm not going to go through these in great detail, all of them, but just simply to say that, that, you know, that there's quite a range of ways of doing interviews in the research context. Actually, it looks like they're almost in, in uh, alphabetical order, but not quite. Um, no particular order, by the way, these. Um, let me start with active. This has become very popular in the in, in last couple of decades, associated with um, two American uh, writers, um, Gubrian and um, Holstein, who, who wrote a book called The Active Interview. Actually, I think it was Holstein and Gubrian, uh, the authors, um, in which they, they, they kind of emphasised the way in which an interview actually is a two-way process of the interviewer indicating things about what they're interested in, what they want, and so on, as well as coming back from the respondent. And it's back to that symbolic interactionist model. It emphasises the fact that a real interviewer, a true interview of this kind, is a, a two-way process. It's not just simply the interviewer, the researcher, asking questions and getting answers. It's a, there's a two-way interchange going on, which is important to recognise and understand, um, and, of course, later on for the researcher to interpret in, in the analysis. Not all interviews are like that, and the active one is kind of pushing the, 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 the way that there is an interaction. It, perhaps a better name for it is interactive rather than the, the active interview. Then there's a biographical interview, uh, which, as the, the name suggests, is about the person's biography. You're asking about their life, and very often that goes through a long period of time. Um, in other words, that you're asking about, you know, that from you know, when they were young through to the present day, and focusing on them and what they did. So it's a bit like the biography you might read a, a, you know, in a book. Uh, your, your interview is about that and focusing on that kind of thing. And people construct a biography for themselves. They have a biography already, perhaps, that they've thought through. But they're very good at constructing a biography for you. And people often... I mean, I think we're all used to this anyway. When we meet somebody new, we often launch into a biography at some stage or some section of a biography. You know, how did I get where I am today kind of questions. We're all familiar with being able to do that. And that's what a biographical interview is about. Very similar to that is the oral history one, not least because some oral history approaches do gather biographies. But oral histories can also focus on a particular period of time. Um, I mean, you know, one common um, uh, situation in, in this country is, or at least it was uh, until they started dying off, was people who lived through the Second World War. People who were uh, young people, uh, young children and so on during the war, um, during the, the 1940s. What was it like to be there? And their oral history was a way of gathering from a range of people their experiences of that period. So it's historic because it's years ago and it's oral because people are talking about what they experienced and what they saw. And so there's a focus on that kind of recapturing the kind of experience of that time in those interviews. A quite different kind of interview is the collaborative or group uh, interview. And in one sense, this is simply interviews done with a group of people. So it's the same process as any other uh, very often depth interviews, um, but it's done with more than one interviewee present. One particular form of this is the focus group, uh, which, are, uh, which of course you, you, you know a lot about now because you've looked at the DVD I gave you a couple of weeks ago and uh, you've seen the good examples on there. If you haven't, have a look at it. There's some really good examples of how to do focus groups on there. Focus groups are slightly different from a simple group interview. You do all kinds of things with groups and particularly in a focus group, you're interested in the interaction between the people that are being interviewed. 
Now that comes across too in group interviews, and that's partly why you do it in a group, because people um, can pick up cues from, from others being interviewed about what to say and what happened and so on, and that's quite important um, in, in getting the, the subject matter from them. So group interviews are just simply interviews done with a group of people, but they can be transformed into focus groups if you do more than just simply ask questions with them. Another type of interview, not done much these days, but I, I do remember coming across an example, um, oh, some decades ago now, um, where um, the interview was much more combative, you might say, a bit like a, a, a Jeremy Paxman type interview. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jeremy Paxman is a, 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 a broadcaster on, on Newsnight TV programme who's famous for asking very difficult questions to politicians. He has a very abrasive technique sometimes and pushing the questions home until they answer what he wants to know. So the Jeremy Paxman approach is to, to be quite combative. This particular research I was thinking about um, was done many years ago about the um, anti-nuclear groups in France. And what the, um, the researcher had done there was to get two people together in the same room who represent different views on the topic. So you'd have in the room an anti-nuclear protester, protesting of banks' nuclear, nuclear power stations, along with somebody who worked for the nuclear industry and getting them to talk about the topics together with each other and ask them both the same questions and, and see if how they, you know, the answers sparked off each other. So combative kind of, of interview. Very hard to do, very hard to make it work, I have to say, because it very often degenerates very quickly into arguments which, which go nowhere. Um, but on the other hand, it's a kind of bit like a focus group, but whereas in a focus group you tend to have large numbers of people, and very often the focus group have similar kind of background, similar views, in this case it was deliberately done to get different views from people and ask them uh, the, the same questions. Another kind of interview is a long interview, um, or a repeated interview. The long interview often is, is one going over a long period of time. Um, now, of course, interviews don't normally last more than an hour and a half, two hours. People get tired, they have to go out and get some food and go to the toilet and so on and so forth. Um, but, but you can interview over a long period and particularly go back several times. You might do it over several days, um, but more commonly, you go back on several occasions. And so you interview them and then you interview them again a few months later and again a few months later. And that gives you a, a way of getting a, a, a sense of change over a period of time, of, of adjustment to things and so on. So it's a, a kind of longitudinal kind of approach. Another approach that's been used here is the multiple interviewer. In this case, you may have one interviewee, but maybe two interviewers. Um, so you have more interviewers than you, than you have respondents in, in, the, in the room. Uh, now, that's quite intimidating. Most occasions when you're doing research, that would be incredibly intimidating to the respondents and would definitely not be you know, um, a good idea. But in some cases, the people you're interviewing are very powerful, they're very self-assured. and this, So this kind of work has been done when interviewing um, politicians, uh, when interviewing um, captains of industry, that kind of thing. People who are, who are very powerful and used to dealing with, with you know, larger numbers of people asking them questions. The advantage from the research point of view is that one person asks the questions, the other person listens and watches very carefully what's going on and can perhaps intercede at some points and say, well, can we know more about that? So they, they, can, be, they can be doing the thinking, which is very hard for the interviewer to do because the interviewer is having to ask the questions and think at the same time. It's actually a very difficult job. So having two brains, if you like, on the interviewer's side can be helpful to get more from the situation but only do it when it's appropriate for the respondents, because most respondents would find that far too intimidating. Another type is a projective interview, where you're asking the people not just questions about what they've done, but rather asking about what they might do. So this is the, the what-if type interview. Um, you're projecting them into situations. So if this happened to you, or if you were so-and-so, what would you do here for? Here's a picture of something happening. If you were that person in the picture, what would you be doing next? That kind of thing. So it's projection of the person from what they've done into something different. And the interview is asking about how they res respond to that. And it's trying to get to the underlying um, motivations and, and feelings and attitudes and so on of, of the people. And last, but on my list at least, but not of all the kinds here, the narrative interview. 
Um, I'll mention this again briefly in a moment. But the narrative interview is one where you're asking people to give a narrative. It, it overlaps to some extent with the biographical, um, but the biographical, if you like, is the whole life. The narrative might be much more focused on a particular incident, particular aspect of life or whatever. But the point about the narrative interview is you're asking people to give a narrative. Now, you don't say to them, please give me a narrative. Don't put it like that. But what you do do, very often, is start with a very open-ended question that says, what I want to do here is give you a chance to talk at length about what happened to you when and what your feelings were about it and so on. Um, so you, you start with a, a, perhaps quite a lengthy introduction that says to people, I want you to talk about this thing and tell me the story of what happened to you and so on. And once they're given that cue, people actually are very good at giving the answers at length and, and telling the story um, with all kinds of interesting structural elements. And, and you know, narrative analysis is about trying to, to extract those structural elements from the, the, the story, the narrative that they give in response. A narrative interview often has very little inter intervention from the interviewer. So the interviewer's job is mainly to say, hmm, yes, oh, uh, you know, those kinds of responses to get people carry on talking and, and to ask very few questions. That, that mean that you might say the most, the most um, or the best possible narrative interview has one question at the beginning and then the person talks for an hour and a half. That would be wonderful. Uh, it doesn't always happen like that. You sometimes have to have you know, extra questions in there. But, but it's surprising, actually, once people get going, how well respondents are about telling their story. And that's because we all do it anyway, all the time. We're used to it. And, and we're very good at, at, at relaying our, our, our thoughts and feelings in that kind of way. 